none other than Ivan Van Zerdema. I appeared before Congress on July the 7th, 1987. I'd been summoned there to give due cause why should not, they should not refer to Columbus's accidental stumble into the Caribbean, which he thought was the backside of India, as a discovery. I remember when I entered the chamber, this gentleman, head of the Queen's Centenary Commission, came up to me and said, you don't mean to say you come here to say Columbus did not discover America? I said, yes. He said, you must be mad. I said, you look mad to me, too. <laughs> As a result of my presentation, Congress decided to delete the word discovery from official documents. I presented a vast, vast body of evidence, um, and it this started as a peculiar accident because um, I was in the British Information, I was in services, then I was in the British Information Services, and never intended to come to America. I'd heard such dark things about America, but I'd heard dark things about most countries. Anyway, I was on my way back. Uh, my Prime Minister had invited me to read poetry at the occasion of our, the independence of our country, independence celebrations, because I was known then as a poet. And I was on my way back, and Yan Karu, a famous Guyanese author, invited me to come to America. And I said, no, 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 I'll never go to America. I've heard such dark things about America. No, no, no. He said, don't be foolish. There are dark things about all places in the world. You come and check it out. So I came there on a Saturday. Sunday morning, he was asleep, and I came down into his library, and I saw three green books, Africa and the Discovery of America, by Leo Wiener. This was done, I think, in the 1920s. The problem with Leo Wiener, however, he was strictly a linguist. And I felt that finding a number of African words in America would not be enough to prove the point, to prove something like that which would up overturn a great amount of thinking would call for a vast body of evidence in many fields. So I, I actually began a critique of this 30 years ago. I actually began to attack my own subject. I didn't know it would become my subject because it wasn't good enough. Linguistics, I, I was trained as a linguist, and I know that you could occasionally get a number of words. You would have to prove a lot of things. You would have to have evidence in many fields to prove something like this. So I sent it to the editor, and I said, if anyone could show me just a few sculptures or portraits of Africans in America before Columbus, I would take another hard look at this matter, because he, he presented no pictorial proof. And he knew nothing about skeletal material, so he couldn't provide skeletal proof. And the editor at Random House, Charles Harris, called me up and said, Van Sertima, something strange has happened on my table. You ended your piece by saying, if anyone could show me images of Africans in America before Columbus, I would take another hard look at this matter. And I turned the page, and I turned the page, and I turned the page. There were seven images of Africans. John Williams, the novelist, author of The Man Who Cried I Am, had been to Mexico and met a strange German, last of the Royal House of Germany. Hitler put him in charge of the German embassy in D.C. And something happened, and he was dismissed. I was later to find out why he was dismissed by Hitler, because Hitler sent around a circular saying that everyone in the diplomatic service has to sign a statement saying they're a pure Aryan. And von Wuttenau wrote back, now he was a conk, the last of the royal house in Germany. This is strange for von Wuttenau, strange for anybody in that position. Wrote back to say, there is no such thing as a pure Aryan. All people have black blood. Oh God, he had to flee after that. Because <laughs> Hitler would have gotten him. So I rushed off to Mexico to meet this strange man. And I went to his chateau. I'd, he'd heard about me because I had written him first. 
and told him what I had done. And we sat in that place, okay? We sat on his steps half the night arguing because he couldn't, you have to show me a hell of a lot of evidence to convince me of something that everybody believes is, is true history. And he says, I said, I have to see these heads. He said, I have a few in my study. I said, that's not good enough. I have to be sure that they are valid, that you are now making this up. He was a little annoyed by that. He wanted to throw me out of the house. But nonetheless, I persisted. You have to prove this to me. I need to see sculptures of these people. And he says they're not in the big museums. They don't take chances like that in the big museums. You have to go to private collections. And the next day, he started to take me to private collections. And I was utterly stunned. You would be surprised how much history is hidden in private museums. They don't allow these things in the big places. It's just like in, in Egypt. I am responsible for returning to the modern Egyptians the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin which Napoleon's army blew off. A friend of mine, Garland Roberts, an adventurer, he was in England, he went into the British Museum, and he found that they had the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin how he did that, but he's a, he's a fellow, he's, da he's a daredevil. He would risk his life just to prove a point. And I says, you go back there. I'm going to pay your way to Britain. You go back and photograph the damn thing. Pretend you are a, you know, messenger boy, whatever it is. Get a job there. Get the damn thing. And he brought back startling pictures. And I call Sheikh Antadjop head of the radiocarbon laboratory in Dakar, he's dead now. He was the leading African scientist. And I got in touch with him and I told him what had happened. And I got in touch with Gamal Abdel Mokhtar, the, the, the Arab delegate at UNESCO. Sheikh Anta was at UNESCO too. And I got in touch with, I told Carla Roberts, you know, he has to be on the phone. And, I, and we started a conversation with the British Museum. And I started out by saying, sir, we understand and we have hard visual proof that you have the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin in your museum. And I have the Arab delegate at UNESCO here and the African delegate, etc. And we'd like to negotiate the return of the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin to the Egyptians. Now, okay, okay. No, no, Van Sertima, we can't do that. <laughs> See, most of the things we have in our museums come from all over the world. If we started returning things to this and that country, we'll have no museums. <laughs> I said, sir, we're not asking you to destroy the museum. This is a specific object. This is a matter of the very gravest importance. I have on the line with me Gamal Abdul Mokhtar, the Arab delegate, Sheikh Antidi up the African delegate, Myself, Garland Roberts, who has proof that they were the pieces, it's me, he photographed them. And he said, well, we will consider it. Do you know? Sheikh Anta spoke, I had a French translator. Sheikh Anta spoke, I spoke, Garland Roberts spoke. Do you know the Arab delegate? We're returning it to the bloody Arabs, you know. He never said a bloody word because the Arabs are not Egyptian. Don't make any mistake about that. It's just like we are in this room here. This is America. It would be hard to find a Native American in this room. The world has changed dramatically. There have been half a dozen invasions of Egypt, the Persians, the Greeks, the Syrians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs. That is not Egypt. Egypt is no longer Egyptian. They have not a damn thing to do with the building of the pyramids. We now have hard proof, very hard proof, that Egypt was African when the pyramids were built. There is no question about it. This is not guesswork. This is not theory. We found the skeletons in the ancient graves. We found sculptures, which you'll never see when you go to Egypt. They don't put those things on display. But now we have the hard proof. 
and I'll deal with that later when we come to deal with the Egyptian section of this lecture. But I appeared before the Congressional Committee and I presented 12 witnesses, all European, because they're going to say I'm Afrocentric if I show them Af this African said this. No, no, no. I'm going to take the very people that you think you will listen to. Columbus is the first person. I said, that's how I began. I, I'm not the first person to suggest there were Africans in America before Columbus. Christopher Columbus is the first person to say that. He actually says in the Journal of the Second Voyage that when he was in Haiti, Native Americans came to them and told them that black-skinned people had come from the south and southeast trading in gold-tipped metal spears. Columbus may or may not have believed, but he actually collected samples of these spears. They were sent back to Spain. They were meticulously, microscopically examined in Spain. And they were found to be identical, not just similar, identical with spears being forged in African Guinea. Of 32 parts, 18 were of gold, 6 of silver, and 8 of copper. Not only were they identical metallurgically, the words the Africans were using for these spears were the words the Americans were using. African word for gold, Ghana. That's why it's called Ghana. Gold Empire, the Golden Empire. And I checked it out in several African languages, Sarakole, Saninke, Gadzago, Kane, Vayan Mende, Kani, Kisi, it's Kani, Kono, it's Kani, Pule, it's Kane. That's the word for gold, and that's the word Americans are using, and they have their own bloody gold word. Why are they using this strange word? And presenting material which, when checked out, when the metallurgists checked it out in Europe, they found the spares were identical in the ratio of gold, silver, and copper alloys. How could you have linguistic and metallurgical identities like that? It is utterly impossible. Not only that, I then went beyond that. I not just showed Columbus. Ferdinand wrote a book about his father, and he said, my father told me that he saw Negroes north of Honduras. Columbus knows what the so-called Negro looks like. He was in Africa. That's how my book began. Columbus sitting at a table in Africa, arguing with the, the Portuguese. I tracked this man down. <laughs> it is possible when you become very famous, people could track every little thing. Who you slept with, <laughs> who you tried to kill, <laughs> who slept with your wife or your husband, everything. And one found a hell of a lot of stuff on this clown, <laughs> or rather this villain. He did some horrible things. He's, yes, he's known as the great discoverer. Ferdinand said, my father told me he saw Negroes north of Honduras. He not only heard of them in Haiti, he actually saw them north of Honduras. Vasco Nunes de Balboa, on September the 25th, in the year 1513, I've got it down to the day. He's coming down the slopes of Paracu in Darien, which we now call Panama. And he and his men saw two tall black men among the Native Americans. They are startled. They haven't brought no black people there. Several of them commented it. Peter Martyr said they must have been shipwrecked. Then he also said they were Ethiopians. Well, Ethiopians, the word Ethiopian is not used for people of Ethiopia. The reason why Ethiopia gets that name, Ethiopians means burnt skin. People of burnt skin would generally call them Ethiopians. So it's not referring to Ethiopia. Peter Marcer said they must have been shipwrecks. Lopez de Gamara said these blacks Balboa saw in the Indies were identical with the blacks we saw in Guinea. Rodrigo de Colmenares saw blacks, captain of Balboa saw blacks east of the Gulf of San Miguel. Alphonse de Catafact reporting his book, Study of Panama. Um, no, Labe Brasso de Bourbeau was the guy who went to Panama, said there were two distinct people in Panama. The Mandinga, black skin, and the Tule, red skin. The red skin would be the Native American. And Alphonse de Catafact, presents us with a map showing blacks 
in various places in early America. The Charus of Brazil, the Jamasi of Florida, and the Caribs of Saint, the Black Caribs of St. Vincent, pre-Columbian. Alonso Ponce cites them off Campeche in Mexico. River Palacio cites them off Tegucigalpa in the Nicaraguan Honduran border. Raman Panea pre speaks of them as the black gold traders. Fray Gregorio Garcia cites them off Cartagena, Colombia. A dozen Europeans, Christopher Columbus, Ferdinand Columbus, Vasco Nunes de Balbo, Peter Marte, Lopez de Gamara, Rodrigo de Colmenares, Alphonse de Catafax, L'Abbé Brasur de Bourbourg, Alonso Ponce, River Palacio, Raman Pane, Fray Gregorio Garcia, seeing things that are not there. <laughs> Probably blacks are haunting their dreams. It's absurd. You cannot have 12 eyewitnesses to event that never happened. And I have not just 12 eyewitnesses. That is just one piece of evidence. I have 12 pieces. So it's not just the eyewitnesses, the metallurgical evidence that it was tested, they were found to be identical in the ratio of gold, silver, and copper alloys as spares being, for, spare being forged in Africa and Guinea. 18 parts gold, 6 silver, 8 copper. How could you have identities like that? Then there's the linguistic identities, which I just mentioned. Saracolis and Inki, Gadzago, Vai, Mende, Kisi, Konopul went through half a dozen African languages to check out the word. And they're using the same bloody word that Americans are using. How is that possible? If it was a European, you only need one piece of evidence. I'm giving you seven. How could you deny that? And it doesn't stop there. There is the botanical evidence. Take the banana. We use the word banana for the banana. But that's not the African word for the banana. The word for the banana is bakoko in Africa. Banana is an Arab word. The Africans didn't have bananas. The bananas were introduced into Africa by the Arabs very early, and they have a different word for it. Banana. They do not have banana. They have bakoko. I have checked the bakoko words because they found bananas in Peru. Peru didn't have bananas. Pre-Columbian Peru is not supposed to have. They didn't have original bananas. The banana. The reason why we found the banana is because when they buried their dead, they would have ceremonies every year, the year of the, the, the day of the death, and they would put fruit in the grave, and among the fruit they put in the grave was the banana, and they do not have original, they do not originally have bananas. That has been checked out. It's only found in these graves. If they were eating the banana, we'd find out a kind of evidence. And the word for the banana in Peru is the same as the word Af the Africans have. We call it banana, but the Africans call it bakoko. So I started checking out the words in Peru. How did this banana appear? They don't have bananas at that time in South America. And found in Galibi, it's bakuku. In Oyapok, it's bako. In Oyampi, it's ba these are all South American languages. In Oyampi, it's bako man. Tupi is bako ba because pop and pop are interchangeable plosives. In, in Apiacus is Pakowa. In Puri it's Baho. So you have Pakoko, Bakuku, Bako, Bakome, Pakoba, Pakoba, Baho. Can't happen unless you have a connection, a very early connection. And then comes the oceanographic evidence because most people say, here is Africa and here is America. How could the Africans cross? They only have canoes that Tarzan can turn over in the movies. <laughs> but that is not, that's another myth again. First of all, there are two things here that they did not take into account. I lived on a river. My father was superintendent of road and river transport over an area that was as large as Scotland and Wales. I grew up in the river. I grew up in the river. And my mother and father were divorced. That was the first divorce in our country recorded divorce in our country. They later remarried. That was the first recorded remarriage in our country. <laughs> I wouldn't advise you to do it. It doesn't work. <laughs> but anyway, they did it in order to save the children, and I am grateful to them, but they suffered. But anyway, to come back, you have this knowledge. I had this knowledge of currents because we, I used to swim three and a half miles across the water to the air base. 
that was a big thing to show how you are. You know, boys are like that. They're always playing the ass, trying to prove they're strong. <laughs> Several of us drunk. So you could see what I mean by playing the fool. Anyway, I used to swim across the river, so I was extremely strong. And I knew about currents. Because most people think the river is just like that. No, the river is alive. In certain parts of the falls in Guyana, the water is running as fast as a motor car. You don't have to have an engine. You have to know how to steer. Or it hits you against the rock and you're blown to pieces. The water moves as fast as a motor car. And in those waters, they do not move as fast as the motor car, the great rivers, but they move with force and take you places. And we have discovered three currents of Africa that take you automatically to America. There's one of the Cape Verde, one of the Senegambia coast, one of the southern coast of Africa. Once you are caught in those currents, you have to come to America unless the fish get you first. <laughs> Whether you have an engine or not, that, the water is the engine. It's very powerful. And it's exactly where those currents end that we find the African presence. It goes to Mexico. It goes into other parts of America. It goes to Brazil. They've recently found, listen to this, look at the lies involved here. They recently found an African Negro woman, I say Negro because not all blacks are Negro. The African has six faces. For example, if you're in a dry African climate, you have a narrow nose. If you're in a wet or moist African climate, you have a broad nose. Most people don't know that. They don't know they have six types of African. They're the nilotic type. They're all black. But they have the nilotic type, the so-called true Negro type. They, the all, all sorts of types they have. And I have in my new book the faces of the various types. And all of these types appear. But what is most extraordinary is the evidence we have of their ships. They had the ships. Thor Heyerdahl became world famous because he got the Baduma people on Lake Chad to build a boat that the Africans built before Christ. Thor Heyerdahl used the boat the Africans built before Christ. They showed him the model. They built the boat. He financed it, a boat they were using before Christ, and it crossed the Atlantic successfully. Heyerdahl told me, Van Sertima, we did not even have to fish. The fish jumped on board. Because in those, in those currents are millions of fish, millions. And it wasn't just Heyerdahl. Alain Bombard also tested African boats. And, and they made it in less time than Vespucci. You have several, if you study the, the, the work I have done in, in the, the new book, Early America Revisited, you see these guys made it in less time than the European boats because of their knowledge of the currents. And they're not only currents of the Cape Verde, of the Senegambi coast, of the southern coast of Africa that take you to America. They're currents that spin you back towards Africa. We have an evidence of a boat, American boat, Native Americans landing in Africa 62 BC. There were seven in the boat because it was an accident. They were taken that because the currents that not only take you there and pull you back. We don't have any evidence of Europeans doing that. We have it in Native American 62 BC. That is in my book, they came before Columbus. And apart from this oceanographic evidence, there's the navigational evidence. That's the boats. The Africans had the boats. The Africans built the boat for Heidel. Heidel became world famous about how he crossed the Atlantic. He didn't build the boat. It was Africans who built the boat for him, a boat they had used before Christ, the Baduma people on Lake Chad. It's in my new book, Early America. You will see the boat. The Africans built it. They could easily have crossed. 
And when you cross, the current actually takes you into the Caribbean, to Brazil, or parts of South America, to Mexico, etc. Recently, the, listen to this, look at the cheating going on, look at the profound dishonesty of scientists. They found a Negro woman in Brazil, in Brazil, where the currents come from Africa, the Caribbean, Brazil, etc. They found a Negro woman in Brazil, 12,500 years old. That is even before the Native Americans. Now, Negroes always came from Africa, but it was so embarrassing that they suggested, yes, it's a Negro, but it came from Asia. <laughs> now, this is Brazil, you know. Brazil is on the Atlantic coast. To come from Asia, you have to get a boat that's going to take you all the way to South America, and then you, you, you have no car. Currents may take you, help you to get to South America, but then you have to walk to Brazil. Then you get the tip, you have to walk. Walk all the way to Brazil to drop your skull. <laughs> and the, 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 the New York Times ran the story like that, you know, thinking, and they even changed the name. When they found this Negroid woman, they call her Louisa because the first human we found in art is Lucy in Africa. So they call her Louisa. But when it got to the New York Times, they call her Valherbe or Malherbe or something like that. And she comes from Asia. Niggers don't come from Africa anymore. They come from Asia. You find them in the wrong time, in the wrong place. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I mean, well, how far can you take this nonsense? It, it is absurd. And you find also skeletal evidence. Listen to this, because I have to be very careful here. I was in two intelligence services in the world, the Guyana Intelligence Service and the British Intelligence Service, and you're not supposed to tell secrets. So I have to say this in a way that shows that I don't know nothing. Okay. <clears throat> they found two African skeletons in the United States Virgin Island at Hull Bay, St. Thomas. These skeletons were found in a strata or layer of art which is datable 1250 AD, two and a half centuries before Columbus. But they could not date the bones. Something strange had entered the bones of these skeletons. Now, I know why something strange had happened, what, why something strange had entered, because of something that was done in that area. And I'm not allowed to talk about it. All I could say is now far from Cuba, and Cuba was giving us some trouble, and we had to tell Castro, come on, we're the world power, so don't play the fool with us. We'll teach you a lesson. That's all I'm allowed to say. But I went down to the Virgin Islands when I heard about these skeletons. And they promised, I, I shamed Vesalius, the archaeologist of the island. I spoke to the whole university, a big crowd, shamed him. He said he'd allow me to see the skeletons. Come there by 12 o'clock the next day. I arrived 10 to 12, raced across the island. Arrived at 10 to 12, the door was locked. Well, I am a very nice person. But when I get angry, I'm not very nice. So I ran at the door, wham! <laughs> Shook the place, the police came out. What are you doing here, sir? I was invited here. You know the place, don't you see the place is closed? Yes, sir, but I, it's very strange that it should be closed. I was invited here, I was to come here by to move along, sir, or we have to arrest you. Well, I moved along. But fortunately for me, friends on the island who'd heard of my interest and I'd spoken to the university there, they took me to a rock pool at St. John. That was St. Thomas where they found the skeletons. They took me to a rock pool at St. John's in the Virgin Islands. And they wanted to show me carvings of tropical animals. When I saw these carvings, I said, no, 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 no. That, that is not evidence. Those tropical animals are, sh are in both places, both Africa and America. But as I was preparing to leave, the light of the sun shone on the rock, just above the rock pool. And I looked down and I saw a strange formation, dots and crescents. And I said, nature cannot do that. Nature cannot do that. It's because it will wash against the rock and it may cause uh, a kind of uh, cleavage in the rock, but it can't 
make perfect curves and dots, dots, and car cannot do that. So I went down there and I cleaned the rock and I photographed it. I sent it to various parts of the world. I sent it to Africa. And so someone in Africa, in Ghana, said it's the Gay Nami sign. And I said, send me evidence of the Gay Nami sign. And he sent it to me. And I said, no, no, no. Don't waste my time, man. That doesn't look anything like the Gay Nami sign. But I kept taking it wrong. And eventually, Dr. Barry Fell of Harvard, he's dead now. He'd written America BC. The New York Times ran three pages attacking me and fell. I brought out, they came before Columbus. Barry Fell brought out America BC. He was dealing with other kinds of contacts. I was dealing with the African contact. And New York Times ran three pages attacking me and fell. They wouldn't even allow anybody in America. But fortunately for me, Dr. Clarence Wine, the oldest of American archaeologists, who'd been on the place where they found the stone heads with African faces. He wrote a marvelous essay on me. And because he was the oldest American archaeologist, they couldn't kick out his essay. So he said, I am absolutely convinced of the soundness of Van Sertiman's conclusions. So in spite of all that, it came through. But look now, the skeletons we cannot move on because recently we have another clown who's entered the Virgin Islands and he's saying now that even though they're in strata 1250 AD, um, these skeletons could not be, um, they are, could not be Africans because they have, uh, could not be proper Africans because they have something teeth, you know, have some problem with the teeth. And Africans cannot have that problem because they are some sort of nonsense, but they don't eat certain things, you know, so that they, I mean, the most absurd, I mean, it's, I, I find it difficult to remember it because it is so absurd, I do not know how long I could keep it in my golden brain. <laughs> I mean, these people are awesome. I mean, it, it, look, look, what incredible evidence. If I did not find that script which was translated, plunge in to cleanse yourself. This is water for ritual ablution before prayer. Because Barry Fell says, it's Libyan, so I sent it to the Libyan Department of Antiquities. And they came up with the translation. Plunge in to cleanse yourself. This is water for ritual ablution before prayer. And then comes a map. It's in my new book, a map of Brazil that shows independent black settlements in Brazil, pre-Columbian. And then comes the oral evidence in Mali. They speak of a king, Abu Bakari II, who wanted to cross the ocean because he felt there was land beyond. And he appears, the Mexicans report this strange black man in white robes appearing. And it is also reported by the Arabs because Mansa Musa went to Cairo. He's a Muslim, and he went to Cairo. And when he was in Cairo, he talked about, they asked him, what happened to your brother? And he told him that he wanted to cross the ocean, and he never came back. And it's recorded by the Arabs in al Kashandi and the Masalik al-Absar, Fir Mamalik al -Absar. So that's the documented evidence. Then there's the iconographic evidence. So I've presented 12 pieces of evidence, eyewitness accounts, methodological evidence, linguistic evidence, botanical evidence, oceanographic evidence, navigational evidence, skeletal evidence, epigraphic evidence, the script, cartographic evidence, the map, oral evidence of the Mali Greers, documented evidence, the Arabs, al Kakashani, the Masili Kalabsar, the Mamele Kalamsar, and the iconographic evidence. That is, you look at my book and you're going to see sculptures of Africans. There's everything. The texture of the hair, the shape of the faces, lips, noses, everything. And one of the things they found, and I'm not going to talk about it, at this point in the lecture later, they found something that is so astonishing that they are utterly embarrassed. And this, that was found after. But here is the 13, 10, 13, 11 journeys where I present 12 pieces of evidence. I did not know of an or even earlier visit because that is what I presented the Congress. 
and they decided to delete the word discovery. So let me make it quite clear. Truth, trust to the ground will rise again. Now we come to another part of this BC, something that happened before Christ. Now, Egyptians made a journey across the Atlantic. How did they do that? Why did they do that? How do we know that they, do it? they did it? Listen carefully. Do not confuse modern Egypt with ancient Egypt. These are two totally different worlds. Here we are in America, and it would be very difficult to find an American in this room. We call ourselves Americans because we are in America. We are American citizens. But there are African people here, European people perhaps, Asian people, but no Americans. I am part American. I am part Makusi Indian and part African. But it would be difficult to find an American audience that is pure American. That's why Egypt, do you go to Egypt? And you said, the Arab is not an Egyptian. The people who built the pyramids were not Arabs. I know, man, because I am responsible for returning to the bloody Arabs, the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin, and the Arabs do not want to remake it because it looks Negro. But we can go into the graves. We can go into the graves and we find the hard, hard evidence. The skeletal evidence is overwhelming. But you see, Egypt was so rich. The Africans were so extraordinary. And they were not superior people. You don't have inferior and superior people. This is what makes you superior and inferior. A certain vision of the world. A certain vision of yourself. Many of us have been destroyed, reduced because we've been made to accept other people's vision of us. You look at Hitler. Hitler was a bloody lunatic. We threw him in prison in his early 20s. Hitler was walking about the prison like this. Guards bowed to him. That was an awesome person, boy. I mean, he was evil, but he was awesome. Napoleon, too. Napoleon wasn't even a Frenchman. Most people don't know that. I am destined to glorify a people I hate. Could you imagine that, asked Napoleon? I read his diaries. I am destined to glorify a people I hate. And then the one thing I regret most in my life, this is Napoleon. The one thing I regret most in my life is that I did not make Toussaint. I did not make the black Toussaint governor of Haiti. I blame it on my black wife. Do you know Napoleon was married to mulatto from the West Indies? Which we would call black hair. But do you know? She was the prejudiced one, not Napoleon. Napoleon wanted to make Toussaint governor of Haiti. His wife said, no, why would you give up territory to nigger? He's as crude as that. So bear in mind, here I am responsible. I financed a telephone link-up between Gamal Abdul Mokhtar, the Arab delegate to UNESCO, Sheikh Antony Up, the African delegate to UNESCO, myself, the representative of the British Museum, Garland Roberts, who found the pieces, and another gentleman who did translations from the French. And the British began, no, no, Van Sertima, we can't do that. <laughs> because if we start returning this item and that item to this and that museum, we'll have no museum. I said, sir, we're not asking you to return everything from your museums. You're well aware of the things that have been taken from other museums and other places. This is a very specific thing. It is of no value to you. You can't show it. What is the point? You can't show the splinters of the nose. Nobody's interested in splinters. Put the nose back on. <laughs> but the Arabs do. The Mokhtar, the Arab delegate, never said a bloody word. Boy, he don't want no nigger nose interfering with the tourist trade in Egypt. He's as crude as that. 
Look why Egypt is no longer Egyptian. Those are not the people who built the pyramids. The Syrians attacked in 654 BC. The Persians attacked in 550 BC. The Greeks attacked in 320 BC. The Romans attacked just before and after Christ. The Arabs attacked 638 to 640 AD. That is why Egypt is no longer Egyptian. They have nothing to do with the building of the pyramids. If you go back in the graves, we have found hard evidence in the graves that the Egyptians were African. Let me listen to the anthropologists, all the great anthropologists. Because this is hidden, this doesn't come out in history books. The earliest human fossil found in Egypt was a skeleton of the Nazlet Kataman found near Tata, Egypt, which was dated 35,000 to 30,000 years before Christ. Regarding the racial affinity of this skeleton, Toma concludes strong alveolar prognathism combined with fossil prinacillus and an African skull is suggested with negroid morphology. He proves it's a negro. Then comes Wendorf, 1982 Wendorf the skeleton, discovered the skeleton at Wadi Kubaniya, located 10 to 15 kilometers north of Aswan in Egypt. This skeleton dated approximately 20,000 years before Christ. The wide nasal aperture, lower nasal margin morphology, presence of the sulcus prinacillus, wide interorbital distance and alveolar prognathism demonstrate affinities with broad African variants. All of the great anthropologists, archaeologists, Thoma, Ferenbach, Wendorf, Stuart, Green, Armilagos, Wrightmore, Crawford, all of them prove that those early Egyptians in the pyramid age were African. That's the reason why Mokhtar, the Arab delegate, doesn't want a Negro nose on the Sphinx. Because they don't want to relate back. But the Germans sent me, I have it in my new book, you see a beautiful color photograph showing you what the world was 1,200 years before Christ. The black is on top of the world. He is in charge of Egypt. There's no question about it. And they built the pyramids. The Japanese came to my friend Sheikh Antony Op, asked seeking advice on building a pyramid. And Sheikh Antony Op said, do not use bronze tools. And the Japanese said, how could you say that? The last stage of the Egyptian was the Bronze Age. And he says the last age is not the best age. They, you cannot. The Japanese would not listen. They went there. They made such a mess. They had to throw them out. Bronze tools, the tools broke. They had to use air jack hammers in order to cut the stone. And they could not cut it, the stone, the ancient blacks in Egypt did. Let me tell you, this is scientists reporting with amazement at how these Africans cut stone. The mean variation of the cutting of the stone from a straight line and from a true square is but 0.01 inch in a length of 75 inches up the face, an amount of accuracy equal to most modern optician straight edges of such a length. In other words, we only cut eyeglasses like that. These joints with an area of some 35 square feet each were not only worked as finely as this, but were cemented throughout. Though the stones were brought as close as one five hundredth of an inch or in fact into contact, and the mean opening of the joint was one fiftieth of an inch, yet the builders managed to fill the joint with cement despite the great area of it and the weight of the stone to be moved some 16 tons. To merely place such stones in exact contact at the sides would be careful work, but to do so with cement in the joints is almost impossible. This is Flinders Petrie, our inheritance of the Great Pyramid, London, 1874. Thus the builders of these great monoliths quarried and cut stone within one one thousandth of an inch of mat mathematical perfection and raised the man-made mounting as meticulously as we cut gems. There are approximately two million 300,000 blocks of stone which comprise the Great Pyramid. These individual blocks weigh from 2.5 tons to 70 tons, as much as a railroad locomotive. Originally covered an area of 13.1 acres. The Great Pyramid, listen to this as I close on this part. The Great Pyramid contains more stone than all the churches, chapels, and cathedrals built in England since the time of Christ. If all the stone in this pyramid were sawed into blocks one foot in an edge, and these were laid end to end, they would stretch two thirds of the way around the globe at the equator. The Great Pyramid contains enough stone to construct 30 Empire State buildings.
Now, if you really knew what the African was doing, most of us would not be behaving like inferiors. We'd have challenged the system long time ago. <clears throat> the Africans had a fixation about seven. They had a fixation about seven. They created the seven-day week. There's no such thing, you know. The Africans noticed in Egypt that there are seven orifices in the human body. I can't mention all of them. There's seven primary colors in the rainbow. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. There's seven notes in the musical scale. There's seven layers of skin. There's seven parts of the human brain. There's seven parts of the human eye. Seven is critical in the ages of man. Seven is the age of reason. Fourteen, seven years later, puberty. Twenty-one, seven years later, maturation. Seven, 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 seven. That is why they created the seven deadly sins. Christ was in Egypt. He's not an Egyptian. He's a Jew. He was born in Jerusalem, but he went to Egypt. Read Hosea, out of Egypt shall I call my son. He was brought back to Jerusalem where he was crucified. Seven deadly sins, seven cardinal virtues, seven days of the week. That's the Africans created the seven day week. There's no such thing. Seven, 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 seven. And then they sent out seven ships across the water. Now they had intimate interconnections with the rest of Africa. We have found evidence of that. Lady Lugard reports a visit of Egyptian pharaohs to Hauseland. We have found, and here is where Diop was very helpful to me. Diop and Obenga, Obenga two weeks ago introduced me to an audience in California. Obenga is the most remarkable African scholar in the world at the moment. Sheikh Anta Diop was before, but he died. And I managed to make contact with these gentlemen. Sheikh Anta and I had a, a, a nice quarrel about tobacco because Sheikh Anta was the only African who was allowed to examine mummies in a certain part of Egypt. And he found tobacco in this, mu this mummy, and I was explaining to him that the Africans have their tobacco, the Americans have their tobacco, and I was pointing out that certain distinctions could be made between the two tobaccos and that. In my book, they're using the same term, and I explained why they're using the same term because of a certain kind of pre-Columbian contact, but that it's not the same tobacco. Well, um, the up surrendered and that he was a most remarkable man. I want to dedicate this lecture to him because he had the most profound impact on so many of us. We invited him, we invited him to the Nile Valley Conference and his plane crashed. He didn't die and um, he had to be run, moved from rush from the burning plane and I told him do not come by plane the next time. You are to go and visit your wife in France and then you're to do overland and then you're to take another kind of ship but do not let it be known where you're moving. Okay we are not to talk on the telephone. You have to be very careful about that. The up came to Atlanta. That was a marvelous occasion. He was the most remarkable man I have ever met. And we had these marvelous conversations, etc. But I knew he would die soon, because like John Clark, I noticed it with him too. They do not pay attention to what they're eating. After you get 60, you have to pay close attention to what you're eating. You can't just eat any old thing because it, it dies there, and it's not buried easily. So be very careful. I'm 65, and I know. I exercise every day. Okay, and that's what saved my life last year. I was, I was rushed to hospital last year, and these crooks in the hospital, they want to make money because they know Rutgers pays most of the bill, so they want to make money. Not telling they have all sorts of things on my heart. I said, there's nothing wrong with my heart. Yes, I mean, they have all these sorts of things on my heart three days in the hospital and I don't know what's happening. So I got really mad and when I get mad, I get real mad. I grew up in the bush. 
And when I get mad, I behave like a bushman. <laughs> and all the, all the civilized cover, that disappears completely. <laughs> I just curse, smash up things, etc. <laughs> and so they came, held me down. I said, I want to leave right now. They said, but you can't leave, you know, you're very ill. Something wrong with your heart. I said, there's nothing wrong with my heart. He said, well, if you leave now, you have to pay the bill. I said, well, I've only been here three days. Yes, but your bill is $5,500. <laughs> I say, well, I'll stay. <laughs> um, so, they said, I said, but okay, I make a deal with you. Put me on a treadmill if you think there's something wrong with my heart. And I ran a mile at full speed. And then they shook their head. Well, you're on a bit of stress, but if you had run that mile the way you ran it and there was something wrong with your heart, you would have died. I said, thank you very much for being so truthful at last. But to come back, the incredible things that we're finding now, we found in America, not oh, that the Egyptians made a trip to America. They sent out seven ships. He found it in a tomb in Egypt where the, these ships, seven ships are heading towards the west. Seven was everything to them. So they sent out seven ships. And we, ha we have it in this um, painting among the Ramesses around 1200 BC, these seven ships heading towards the west. And we find intimate interconnections between the Egyptians and the uh, rest of the Africans because people could say, okay, Egypt is separate. Today it is because the Egyptians are no longer Egyptians, just like the Americans are no longer Americans. You come into this room, it would be hard to find a Native American. You go to Egypt and it's hard to find an Egyptian. So be very careful about the past and the present. These worlds have changed dramatically. And so we have lots of evidence of their links to the rest of Africa. Shake Antony up and Theophilo Benga presented, and it's in my new book, more than 100 words in Wolof, a West African language, the language of Sheikh Antony, more than 100 words which are identical in all their forms. That is utterly impossible. UNESCO surrendered. All of these big professors with all their big degrees, so they had to surrender because these two super Africans proved beyond them beyond the shadow of a doubt, that that's all a lot of nonsense. This is clearly what we say it is, and they surrender. It has been established beyond the shadow of a doubt. The connections between Egypt and the rest of Africa were extraordinary. We have Lady Lugar reporting on a visit of Egyptian pharaohs to Hauseland, an Egyptian golden breastplate found in an ancient lair in Nigeria, more than 100 Egyptian words in all their forms and variants found in Wolof, the Ops language. The African word for God, what is the word for God? Amen, you use it in your prayers, that's African. Amen, Jesus was in Egypt, you know. Out of Egypt shall I call my son. He wasn't an Egyptian, he was a Jew, but he went to Egypt. He was smuggled out by his uncle because they were killing off the firstborn. That's how Jesus landed up in Egypt. And the seven day week is Egyptian. Egyptian golden press blade found in ancient Nigeria. As I say, nearly a hundred Egyptian words in all their forms presented to UNESCO. UNESCO had to surrender. They couldn't believe it. Obenga and Diop proved it beyond the shadow of a doubt. They even take the word for God. What is the word for God in Egypt? Amen. You saying it in your prayers, that's Africa. Amen. Amun and Amen is Egyptian, and Am is West African, comes from that, and Nyam is East African. So you have Amen and Amun, Egyptian, and Am, West African, and Nyam, East African. Don't think everything is lost. There are all sorts of clues left in the past, and that if you learn certain things, you can pick them up. So they can't fool us anymore. And we find the incredible things that they did, the building of the pyramids and all these things, but they also built remarkable ships. And we have evidence, not only they show their ships moving, 
but they show, it is shown among the Americans, the purple for the Bible, the Kiche Maya. I have the Bible, the Kiche Maya, that shows blacks arrived in America in, before Christ. Champollion supports that, Leverbour support, Leverbour supports that, Sahagan supports that, Sorensen supports that, South Soderbergh supports that, Rosalie supports that. I've been through all these documents. They're finding these things and people are just pushing them aside, but not anymore. Then came the clincher. I was invited to, before the Columbus celebration, I was invited to the Smithsonian the leading scientific institution in this country, hoping to wipe me out before, 49, before 1992. And my opponent surrendered, showed them the seven braid that you can argue with. No sculpture in America has seven braids. Seven is everything to the African Egyptian. He created the seven day week because he finds there's seven parts to the human brain, seven parts to the human eye, seven, seven notes in the musical scale, seven primary colors in the rainbow, seven orifices in the human body, seven layers of skin. You can't argue with that. So he, event, he invented the seven day week. All this thing about God created the world in six days and rest in the seven. That is taken by the Christians from the Egyptians. Jesus was in Egypt. Even the word Christ, he's not Jesus Christ, he's Jesus the Christ. Christ is an Egyptian word, K-R-S-T, Christ. K-R-S-T, the anointed one. That's how he became the Christ. Don't dismiss him, okay? I'm just pointing out the terms, okay? He was in Egypt, out of Egypt. Read Hosea, out of Egypt shall I call my son. He wasn't born in Egypt, but he was smuggled out in Egypt because Herod was killing the firstborn. And he appears among the Egyptian doctors. And so you get certain evidences like that. And I've checked out this. I have so many sources. Champollion reporting the seven ships arriving from across the water. Champollion, Lefebour, Sahagan, Sorensen, Sav Soderberg, Rossellini, and above all, the Bible of the Kiche Maya. They destroyed so many books in America, but they didn't enjoy, they didn't destroy all the Bibles of the Kiche Maya. So we have that reporting, these dark-skinned people arriving on seven ships, and these, they have the seven ships. And then we have the clincher. We have a map of South America found in ancient Egypt with correct latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates. I showed that to NASA. I was the first person to go to NASA to study blacks in space. You don't even know what, to, it's not only we don't know the history, we don't even know what's happening. Do you know the leading technical astronaut in our space team is a black man, Colonel Gregory. He's restructured the cockpit of our spaceships. Do you know that the leading woman in our space team is a black woman, Dr. Christine Darden? She's reshaping our airplane so that in the next, in the 21st century, we've just entered certain airplanes, not just the, the, the the exotic airplanes would be able to fly faster than some. Do you know that? No. I had to go there. I nearly died at NASA because they invited me along with delegates from all over the world, China, Russia, various, to witness the blast off of the first black American in space. And I did not realize I have different ears. I grew up in a forest. I hear lights. I thought everybody heard lights. You have to hear differently in the forest. Because snakes, you can't see snakes. Snakes take on the color of trees and foliage. Therefore, you have to hear that when he starts. You have to hear that. Are you dead? I didn't know I had different ears. I thought everybody heard lights. I'm standing, these Russian and Chinese delegates, and I'm standing it's five and a half miles away from the spaceship. This is an awesome thing. It's bigger than a house. And we're going to send, shoot it off into space. And they start to count down. And they stop. Something wrong. And I start looking nervously. How could something be wrong? You know, a big thing like that with all this incredible thing. If it explodes, what would happen? Then they start to count down again. The third time they start to count down. You had this tremendous noise and I fell over because my ears, blood came out of my ears. 
because I hear differently from urban people. I grew up in the jungle, I hear different. So that, that, that really startled the hell out of me. I never went back to NASA after that. <laughs> but I'd learned enough about it. It's in a book, Blacks and Science Ancient and Modern. You see me with the leading technical astronaut, etc. And you would be amazed what blacks are doing in this country, totally unknown. Bell Labs employs more than a thousand black scientists. They created the, the transoceanic cable. They were major in that development. They're reshaping our airplanes. They're, they remade the cockpit of the space shuttle. You never hear about that. If a black commits a crime, yeah, that's news. But when he does something extraordinary, oh my God, no, there's something mistake here. It's like the New York Times calling the black Val Herbe, so nobody would think it's the black. Now they're saying this Negro they found in Brazil came from Asia. Could you imagine that? She's going to take a ship all the way to the edge of South America and walk all the way up to Brazil. Because there are no currents of taking her. Walk all the way to Brazil to drop her bloody skull. This is the state of the world we are in. But let me show you the slides now because you have to see some of these things to believe them. So if we could shift to the slides. But the one more thing I must say, just one more thing, very important. They have found a map of South America in ancient Egypt. It was known as the Piri Reis map because of a Turkish admiral who found it there. And it has correct latitude and longitudinal coordinates. No European could have drawn such a map until after 1744 when the chronometer was invented. Yet the Africans had it before Christ. They can't see it. I could put it over here. 